Yo, what's going on, E7 fam? Pat here, back to talk about the May 9th balance adjustment preview that was just shown earlier this morning over on Stove. And I'm just going to say it up front, this patch is, in my opinion, fire. It is one of the best balance patches I think we've seen in quite a long time. Uh, there's very few misses on this thing, and I'm just super excited to talk about it. So let's just get into it. So in this video, we're going to be talking about Blood Moon Haste, the boy, the most requested character to be on this balance adjustment preview. He's finally on this thing. Sage Ball and Cezanne, Ravi, Kane, Bologna, and of course, my two girls, Celine, and last piece, Corinne. We'll also be talking about the artifacts, Alexa's Basket, and Abyssal Crown. And as always, I'll kind of talk a little bit about each of these characters and the artifacts and talk about why they probably landed on this list before we go over what the actual changes are. So wasting no time, first thing to talk about, Blood Moon Haste, arguably the worst Moonlight 5-star hero in Epic 7 currently, and one that a lot of people have been just begging for patch after patch after patch for over like a year and something at this point. So why... Was Blood Moon Haste the most requested character to be on this list? Well, his S1 has little to no utility whatsoever. Uh, his S2 is something from a bygone era. It's a really niche passive. It's basically the thing that tried to keep Arbiter Vildred and later on made Chloe in check with their revives. Uh, the problem with Grudge is that it's not really particularly great outside of fighting those two characters. It's basically just not a passive. It's also really prone to being hit with unbuffable. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of problems there. And his skill three, which was arguably at the time of release, Moonslash was one of the best S3s on a Soul Weaver. It gave damage reduction. It was a team wide heal. And it's a true damage nuke that does pretty good damage, right? For your healer to be able to do somewhere around 7,500 to 10k true damage to a target, like he could outright kill squishies, right? Even if they dodge... Still pretty impressive damage. The problem is that once you use Moon Slash, it, that's kind of it, right? It's just a, it's an all or nothing move. If we use it and it doesn't trigger a revive to get Grudge to proc to give us back the S3, we're just stuck using that lackluster S1 for several turns. So he doesn't really provide like the healing and the utility. You're mostly just going to be sitting on him and just soaking up the uh, the damage reduction passive. So he just has this really passive, not proactive gameplay style when Soul Weavers kind of have evolved. Since Destina got her round of buffs uh, quite some time ago, most Soul Weavers just seem to need to be very proactive in order to actually feel like they do something, whether that's through uh, CR pushing the team, having built-in self-CR pushes, disrupting moves like with Shuna and her sleep, yeah, so Blood Moon Haste needs to be something like that. He needs to feel like a modern Soul Weaver in 2024. And this set of changes, I think, accomplishes almost everything that we talked about that this character actually needed. So I'm going to just let you know right up front, we're basically going to check all the boxes. So S1 has been completely changed now. It still has the base move where it could strip one buff, has 100% chance to strip one buff from the target. When successfully... Dispelling a buff off of a target activates Bloody Retribution as an extra attack. Bloody Retribution attacks the enemy with a scythe and recovers health of all allies. Amount recovered and damage dealt increased proportional to the caster's max health. So they also say here that they decrease the damage on this move. I don't think anyone actually cares that they decrease the damage on Blood Scythe. Because the move already didn't do super amazing damage. The fact is, this character now is a proactive healer. He wants to get in there, scrap with the S1, and if we do the thing that the S1 is supposed to do, well, we get more damage on the character, uh, and also we get to recover uh, some health for our team. So he's actually a way to sustain the actual team. And now when we take a look here at the actual... Uh, S2 here on Grudge, you'll realize that the, the damage on Blood Scythe and Bloody Retribution is probably higher than you are actually thinking it is. So Grudge, now instead of whenever an enemy is revived, gives a barrier and immunity for one turn to your team and resets the S3, instead what it does is it gives you 100% defense pen on the S1, the follow-up attack on the S1, and the S3. 
So this character actually does real damage without needing any critical hit chance or critical hit damage. So your Soul Weaver can actually be a source of reliable damage. Now, in addition to this, when an ally on your team dies, you get a barrier and immunity to all of your allies for not one, but two turns. And also, Blood Moon Haste gets Blood Aura for two turns. Blood Aura is a unique buff, and it doesn't say here if it's dispellable or not, but it increases the effectiveness and speed of Haste by 30%, which those are two relevant buffs. Effectiveness lets us strip buffs from the enemy team, which gives us Bloody Retribution, and speed is definitely welcome when you consider that he is a Pisces Soul Weaver, which is one of the slower zodiac symbols in the entire game it also says here it can only be activated once every four turns so he went from being super niche to probably one of the best soul weavers in the entire game versus aggressive and cleave compositions like if you're a turn two player i think you need haste like if you don't have him like you might want to consider picking him up especially if the buff pans out the way that i think it is because again Cleave has to try to kill people. So if you have like Blood Moon Haste and Karina, right? They have to focus Karina or they die. If they kill Karina, cool. You get a huge, huge barrier for this thing. It says here it decreases the barrier. We'll see because like Grudge is absurd. Grudge is usually like a 60 or 70% barrier of uh, BM Haste max health. Like in the past, it was like 15 to 17K barrier. So it's probably not going to be as big, but still. The condition is so easy to fulfill here, right? And to further cement why I think this character is so good for turn two, especially against Cleave and Aggro, is on the S3 Moonslash. Dispels all buffs from the enemy before it deals damage, right? When the enemy is defeated with Moonslash, revives all dead allies before granting them immortality for one turn. When the caster is granted Blood Aura, which remember you get whenever an ally dies, increases this damage dealt by 100%. And then it also had its cooldown reduced by one turn, and the damage dealt on it is increased. Remember, I already told you, this is a 7,500 to 10,000 damage nuke, and it is true damage. We are doubling that damage if we have Blood Aura. That is an absurd amount of damage coming out of this move. And it's a full team revive. So after they focus down Karina, they have to kill Haste. Which, mind you, is no small task because he is the tankiest Soul Weaver in the whole game. He has the highest base defense in the whole game. He is absurdly difficult to kill. Wow. Just wow. Honestly, they crushed it. With this rework. Anybody who has any doubts on whether or not is Blood Moon Haste going to be good. Uh, we're going to find out. Because on paper this looks incredible. I think if you're a slower player. I think Blood Moon Haste is so back. And I do think that you absolutely need him. At one point I thought that Blood Moon Haste was like the best character in the game. Coming out of the RB meta. Going into the casino meta. He felt like the sleeper best character in the game. He might very well be, at least for slower players, one of the best characters in the entire game after this buff. Next up, we're going to move on to Sage, Ball, and Cezanne. Honestly, basically Sage's biggest issue is consistency. Uh, they don't really have any base effect resistance. And what ends up happening is against affecting the Zeos, they kind of get put in check and don't really do anything, which is, you know, they're meant to counter fast, aggressive team compositions by putting them to sleep to help give tempo back to your team. Against a high effect in the Zeo, that feels almost impossible unless you just have like the best gear ever on the character. On top of that, there is a uh, counterplay to him, and I don't know if necessarily I'd want to check that counterplay, but one of the biggest issues is that when you go for the S2 Cloud of Ruin, if they have something like uh, an Elbrus Ritual Sword character, or like save your Auden, there's a pretty high chance that you're getting countered if it doesn't sleep, uh, and you're just going to take a ton of damage for it. So yeah, consistency issues is definitely his biggest problem. So what they gave him uh, is uh, no green text because, well, 
I guess it's just a problem with the upload. I guess they just forgot to do it. But yeah, instead of his uh, S2 being an 85% chance to sleep the enemy team, it's now 100% chance. So you only have to go through one 15% check, not two 15% checks. It's something. But honestly, I don't think it really addresses his core issues. It is definitely welcome for turn two players, but I don't know if this will necessarily make Sage the go-to choice for most turn two players. I pick him a lot, and that's because I really just enjoy playing the character. But I think for a lot of people who are looking for the strategic anti-cleave uh, usage for him, it's not really going to increase those use cases. It's just going to be a little like nice, like, hey, it's a little bit more consistent. But uh, we still have the same problems with the character, I think, uh, overall. Still stronger, just not too much stronger. Next up, we move to Red Robbie, which honestly has probably one of the shortest, easiest to understand lists of things that I think they needed for a while. They just need free stats because the base kit for Robbie is already incredible. The problem is that she's a attack scaling character, but really wants to be more of a health scaling character, right? So you have to build health in order to survive, like defense and health in order to survive, but you need attack in order to deal damage. And then you still need critical hit chance and critical hit damage. So that's a lot to ask for. But like her S1, uh, it heals, it has great damage, it has a stun built in. Uh, her S2 is, gives her a CR push. Her S3 is incredibly spammable. It's a stun, it defense penetrates, it pushes back the enemy team. Like if you've ever get, gotten hit by Devil Drive, it's absurd. It is an absolutely absurd move. It does great damage, and it basically time walks the opponent not one turn from the stun, but two from the CR pushback, right? That is what made Robbie so strong. A lot of people seem to forget that there was like a whole summer where Red Robbie was like the best character in the entire game. I want to say like probably the summer of 2020 when we first started to really have World Arena competitions when like Shotgun Shogun and stuff was hosting tournament series. That's when Red Robbie was really dominant and probably one of the best characters in the entire game. And people complained that Apocalypse Robbie, in comparison, was just absolutely terrible. But uh, yeah, the kit's always been strong. What's held her back is honestly her base stat line. So let's see what we got here. So there's no longer a stun on the S1 Slaughter, right? And instead, what we got is a successful attack always results in a critical hit. Man, we really hate Navy Captain Landy around here. We really want to make sure that that character is going to die. Amount recovered on this move is also decreased, which that kind of sucks. But you know what? It's a fair trade-off because you're going to be able to build this character way tankier uh, than you think because you don't need to worry about critical hit chance. So now let's move on to the S2 passive. Starts the first battle with 60 fighting spirit as opposed to 40 in the past and increases attack proportional to the caster's max health. The rate of the increased attack effect does not change after it is activated. So what does that mean? Because I know I had to read it a couple of times to really process it and take it in. So what I'm understanding it to mean is that this is an attack scaling character, but really wants to be a health scaling bruiser. Well, in case you haven't noticed, health scaling bruisers are terrible right now because of Death Dealer Ray and Urban Shadow Shoe. So what this does is at the start of the battle, it checks Red Robbie's max health and converts it into attack percentage without changing her multipliers. So she's a health scaling hero now that basically is unaffected by injury because once you actually do the check of HP to attack conversion, it doesn't change. So that's an insanely elegant design decision that allows a bruiser to actually be played as a health scaling bruiser without any of the baggage that is holding back current health scaling bruisers. Like kudos to whoever designed that. That is brilliant. Moving on here. After being attacked, increases combat readiness by 15% and after suffering a critical hit, dispels one debuff from the caster. Dispelling debuff effect can only be activated once per turn. So we got a little bit of Edward Elric action here. Not quite as good as the Fighter Maya action where every attack dispels one debuff and gives us a defense buff. But this is pretty good. I'll take it. Uh, I think that this is overall uh, a good change. You'll note here on the side here in red text, end gains five fighting spirit. That kind of sucks, right? 
But I, I guess it's it eliminates some of the feels bad because if this character is really good, if you've ever played against Red Ravi when she's really good, if she high rolls you and counters a lot, like you're hitting her and then she also counters, uh, Devil Drive becomes live very, very quickly because it's only 70 fighting spirit, right? So it's very, very possible for Devil Drive to come out on turn one, much like Landy's boat sometimes happens if you're really unlucky. That is a major feels bad. So we'll see how that ends up playing out. Uh, especially when we talk about Devil Drive itself, which is now 90 Fighting Spirit to use instead of 70. So they really don't want Devil Drive to go off. They basically increase the use case, but are well aware that Devil Drive is an absurd move. And when we take a look at the changes here, you'll realize that they nerfed it probably even a bit further. So previously, it was an AoE attack with a 75% chance to stun and... If the target gets stunned, they get pushed back by 100% CR, and it also penetrates the target's defense by 50%, right? It's pretty good damage. Like, it's like a 0.9x multiplier for an AoE, which is quite good, right? When you consider that it's a 50% defense pen move, normally, like, 1x is what you'd expect from an AoE. Being, like, almost 0.9 with 50% defense pen, move hits like a truck. So... Brutally attacks all enemies, inflicting injuries. So it's now an injury-based move, further cementing that other health-scaling bruisers are just worthless, uh, before a 75% chance to stun all enemies for one turn. A successful attack always results in a critical hit. Cool, we don't need to build crit on this character again. Man, they really hate this landy unit. The severity of injuries increases proportional to the damage dealt. Injuries decrease the max health of the target by up to 20% every time this skill is used. The base damage is increased because you'll notice we took away the penetrates defense by 50%. We also got rid of the 100% combat readiness pushback. I think overall, we made Devil Drive worse with these set of changes. And I don't know if that's a good thing because, like I said, Red Robbie at one point was just the absolute worst character in the world to play against. Like an absolute nightmare. And I don't know if I want to go back to that. So... I think that this is overall a pretty healthy set of change changes. My worry is that maybe the 90 fighting spirit might be too high. Maybe I think I would have probably left it at 70, especially because we already got rid of the five fighting spirit. If we were going to gut the two most devastating uh, portions of Devil Drive, which is essentially a character got two turns stunned uh, when you think about it, then maybe it's fine. But yeah, this is definitely like the one thing where I'm like, I don't know if I agree with this. Right? This is the one hang-up I have is with Devil Drive. It's it's still strong, but it's nowhere near as absurd as it used to be. And I don't know if that's going to hurt the character in the long run. But it doesn't seem like it. Because again, this passive is just so gorgeously designed. And the fact that we don't need critical hit chance anymore. Like, mm, I I'm definitely super excited to give Ravi a try. Also, her exclusive equipment stuff was changed here. Uh, don't need the Dispel 1 debuff from the caster because it's already built in. Right, So instead, they made it so that the S1 damage is up by 10%. Uh, and then this one has a 70% chance to make the target unable to be buffed for one turn when using Slaughter. It's now changed to Devil Drive's damage goes up by 10%. Honestly, I'm probably still sticking with option number three, which is uh, Devil Drive has higher chance to stun. That's probably still going to be the option, but uh, some people might go for Slaughter damage up just because, well, it's a counter-based character most of the time. Uh, yeah, overall... Very impressed with how they decided to change Robbie. Now let's move on to a character that uh, I'm not impressed with the changes with. And that's uh, Divine's favorite character, or second favorite character behind Troublemaker Crows, it Kane. So Kane needs a niche now that Rift is gone. He also really needs a damage increase, or like some kind of utility increase. Because like his damage numbers, they suck. He has a 0.9x on S1. When 1 to uh, 1x is basically the standard, or 1.1x is the standard at this point, uh, his S2 is a 0.5x multiplier when like 0.7 is like the average, I feel like at this point in Epic 7. And then his S3 is 1.6 and scales up with debuffs. Bro, Spectre's been 1.8x and scales up with debuffs since like 2020. Like, what are we doing here? So let's see what they gave the boy Kane. Uh, his S1 no longer inflicts bleed for two turns, and when he's in rage, it got they got rid of ignores ER, right? And then his AoE 
they got rid of it so it dispels one debuff from the caster, right? So instead, what did we get? Increases the combat radius of the caster by 15% on the S1, aka the laziest thing we could put on an S1, I feel like. They, they want S1s to feel good in the game, so it's always going to end up being silence, stun, CR push, right? Or defense break. That's literally, I feel like, every single modern S1 in, in Epic 7. So we got the the lazy modern design stapled onto it. Sorry, I'm, I don't want to bash the, the the devs, right? The design team too much. I get it. They're just trying to do their job because, again, I've said this before. They'll probably complain or will complain as a community if it's not something like this. So whatever. Uh, Rock Smash attacks all enemies by slamming the ground and inflicts bleeding for two turns, ignores effect resistance. So we moved the bleed component to the extra attack. Uh, Rock Smash damage dealt decreased. Uh, I literally just said to you guys that it's below average damage. Like, why? <laughs> I don't understand why. So, moving on to uh, the S2 passive. Upon receiving lethal damage, grants immortality and vampirism for one turn and resets the cooldown of Feast of Predation. Can only be activated once every six turns. After an ally attacks, if the target has a debuff, gains 10 fighting spirit. And when fighting spirit is full, consumes all fighting spirit to make the caster enrage for two turns. Cool, so we made him easier to enrage because now he doesn't need bleeds on the enemy team. He just needs any type of debuff. I don't get this set of changes. Like, I really don't. I don't think it increases his use case whatsoever. Like, I I don't even know. I think they just put him on the balance patch because they're like, well, people were saying Kane needs something because of Rift. We'll give him something. And then they chose to do whatever this is. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't have anything positive to say about these set of Kane changes, right? Uh, so I'm just going to move on now and talk about Bologna. So Bologna needs a niche or possibly even a rework because currently on live she's only played in two places nightmare raid for the uh, julie fight and as a manic 13 uh, specifically in one shot compositions now it was already a risky proposition to play her in nightmare raid because well against julie her defense breaks can accidentally make the fight harder right well once people realize that Midnight Galilius is just way more consistent and way faster, like literally you could clear the fight in half the time than you could with Bologna, uh, there wasn't really a reason to play Bologna anymore. Like most of the standard compositions now are like two green soul weavers, a Zahak, and a Gala. Like it will literally just absolutely trounce that fight. There's not really a reason to use Bologna there anymore. Uh, like even Vivian, even Vivian is probably a better choice. Zahak Vivian is probably a better choice, especially if you're a newer player that doesn't have Gala because Vivian's free, right? So not really a great use case there. And as I talked about in my Azimatic 13 guide, well, there's been a lot of other comparable or better options in Azimatic 13 for a while. So yeah, kind of needs a rework. So what did we get now? So we changed her soul burn from 10 souls to increase the damage on S3. Two, soul burn for 20 souls, take an extra turn, which will obviously help her build focus stacks, which lets her trigger uh, her bonus S3. Sure, whatever, it's not going to really change anything, I feel like, on the use case of this character. So, also, the S2 damage was increased, which I guess makes one-shotting easier. But other than that, I don't think it really does anything to move the needle on the character. Finally, the... Uh, the defense break chance on the S3 is moving up from 80% to 100% chance and increases damage dealt on the move if it was triggered off of her S1 and the base damage was increased on the damage. Um, It's actually funny because the, having the 100% chance to decrease defense for two turns actually makes her one use case against Juliev even worse. So, yeah. If you're a Green Bologna fan, sure. But uh, I don't think these do anything. If, and if if anything, like I said, it actually hurts her Julieve Council use case. So if anything, this makes, I guess, her one-shot hunt capabilities slightly better. But I don't see it. Let me know down in the comments below if there's something I missed on this character. But this really doesn't feel like a good set of changes. Uh, also, exclusive equipment here. Uh, decreases the cooldown of Butterfly Fan by one turn. This could be particularly good. I recall this being like a three-turn 
cooldown, so maybe it's every other turn. Eh. Now we move on to Selene. So, what does Selene need? Well, first off, I can't mention this character without once again saying LOL Scorpio Thief, the worst defense stat in the game. I'm just going to be on a crusade forever to talk about how terrible the defense stat is on it. I've talked about it at length in things like how to play Specimen Says, how any character with this stat line is just garbage without having some kind of like dodge buff or something in the kit, something that helps them actually survive, right? In general, though, Selene has always been compared to Red Politis. And the thing is that uh, Red Politis is a lot harder to play around than Selene because of better base stats. A Wii counter has Abyssal Crown, can hold book, multiple different flexible build paths. Selene just in general needs to be harder to play around. You can play around it with skill nullifiers. Anti-crit is everyone, uh, everywhere now. Not pressing uh, buttons and just waiting on her terrible stats. There's so many ways you can mess with Selene, right? So what did we get? Well, we have the S1 uppercut. We increased the damage dealt, which is good because if you recall, what uppercut used to be was 1x attack and you got 20% bonus damage if you landed a critical hit, making it a 1.2x, which is the high end for an S1, right? So now the base damage dealt is increased, hopefully to 1.2x. And uh, yeah, she gets stealth for one turn when she uses her S1. That's pretty good. But the thing is, you might be wondering, Sue, hold on. I, I want stealth, but like I also want the dodge buff from Thunderclap. Well, you don't have to worry because the S2 passive now, Intuition, says at the start of the first battle, you get stealth for two turns, which is really good because remember, most openers get rid of one turn of a buff, like Conquer Lilius. So... Uh, yeah, Conqueror Lilius cannot knock this character out of stealth. Not that she'd probably press anyway because, you know, you'll trigger Blink, which is a whole other can of worms. Especially now because uh, the damage dealt on Blink is going up, which makes it even more deadly. You could essentially invest in more bulk stats because you don't need as much damage because the damage on the move is going up. Also, you get uh, 10 souls. Whenever you activate Blink. Which, we'll come back to that in a second. And you also get 30% combat radius, which means this character jumps quite a bit further, right? Uh, the difference between 20% CR push and 30% is a lot. Especially when you consider that she's going to get another, what, like 24 from Storm Sword? So it's like a 54% cut. So, like, it's still like a 27% cut in the face of Polidus and uh, Euphine. Based on your speed, that's still taking the turn, right? Now... 10 souls on Blink is absolutely terrifying because in case y'all forgot, Thunderclap, her S3, is 10 souls to soul burn it. And it's a 2.5x attack multiplier. That's like top four, top five single target soul burn damage in the game. It's like CDOM, Blue Chloe, right? Uh, Assassin Kali, maybe Ilanav. So, yeah, th this thing just, like, deletes characters. And you get that guaranteed whenever you pl uh, proc Blink. That's, that's wild. That's absolutely wild to me. I think they crushed it with this, right? So the fact that she now is going to have dodge in the kit and stealth in the kit and it, the move's going to hit harder and the move's going to push up more. Right? And you're going to get a bunch of souls for your team every time it procs. Like, unless they have like a full strip at the start of a fight, Selene is actually just like terrifying now, right? I, I'm going to definitely be playing a lot of Selene when these buffs go live. Like, she's one of my favorite characters in the game. The reason why I don't use her as much is because she's super easy to play around. Like I said, I don't know how easy she is to play around with these changes. Like, this is a really, really good set of changes for this character. I'm very curious to see how this character pans out going forward. Also, to add insult to injury to anybody who hates playing against Serlene here, uh, the stealth EE, we don't need it anymore because we start in stealth. Instead, now, how about we have a random one-turn stun on Blink? Isn't that fun, bro? You press a button, cool. Random person gets just absolutely murdered, and if they somehow survive, they're probably stunned. 
I love this <laughs> new exclusive equipment. Again, I love Selene. I'm I'm so hyped for this. So the last character to talk about is Last Piece Corinne, one of my favorites again. So currently, a lot of people on live are saying that Last Piece Corinne is probably dead because, well, Shaltir just came out and a lot of people are saying that Shaltir is just better than her and are moving their LPK gear onto Shaltir. Well, maybe this set of changes might make them think twice. Currently, our two best anti-dodge fast characters are Zahak and Last Piece Corinne. Zahak has the injury slant to him and is really good against characters that have buffs, whereas Last Piece Corinne is quite a bit faster than Zahak. I believe she's about seven speed faster on average, so she is much better at guaranteeing that you get that very first turn if that is what you're looking for. But what commonly happens with Last Piece Corinne is if they have Savior on and you want to bring her into that character to try to delete it, they'll pivot to Navy Captain Landy, which will give them critical hit resistance. And if you lose the 50-50 on the critical hit resistance, well, then the character just kind of flounders and doesn't really do a whole heck of a lot, right? So that's really, really rough. Enter Shaltir, who doesn't have that problem because she gets rid of the critical hit resistance on her S3. So a lot of people were saying, hey, uh, LPK is kind of not it anymore because uh, Shaltir is better in the Navy Captain Landy's plus Odin matchup, whereas Zahak has basically every other situation kind of on lockdown. So why would I choose this character, right? So here we are now with uh, a need to diversify for last piece, Corinne. So let's see what she got. So S1, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, this is S2. Phantom Strike is S2, right? So this gets 30% combat readiness now, uh, pushback on it, in addition to the stealth, the barrier, and the increased accuracy. And the base damage on the move is increased, which... That's kind of crazy because the move already kind of deletes characters to begin with. So this means that I might not need to invest as much into the damage of the character. Because right now people play around like 3,000 attack, like 250 to 270 critical hit damage, and then just get as much speed from there as they possibly can. Based on the damage numbers on this, if they go way higher, then we might not need to invest as much in damage and can instead really fully invest, I feel like, truly into more speed for the character, which is obviously uh, a net game. We were already uh, outpacing Shaltir and Zahak by like seven speed base. If we don't need as much damage, then we can absolutely go uh, even higher. And if we don't somehow secure a kill, at least we get a massive pushback, right? Like, so even if you don't actually kill Auden, at least she's going to be sent way, way to the back of the line. So then... Right here, the other thing that we're going to change, we'll go down to the Awakened version, is Blade Art Infinite Sword, uh, also known as Bankai by a lot of people. Becomes one with the sword, granting increased attack and Phantom Sword to the caster for three turns, grants an extra turn, right? Now, they've changed what Phantom Sword actually does, right? Because it says here before, when an enemy, uh, when defeating an enemy while granted Phantom Sword, Phantom Sword changes to Neo Phantom Sword, and decreases skill cooldowns of the caster by one turn. So that clause is gone, but the base cooldown is four turns down instead of five. So we don't have to worry about that. Now, Phantom Sword. When attacking, if the target is a hero, ignores damage reduction and damage sharing effects. And when defeating an enemy, Phantom Sword changes into Neo Phantom Sword. So this move gets around Proof of Valor. Uh, it gets around Arius, Adamant Shield, all that stuff. So this character, when you already factor in Phantom Strike getting a damage increase, the fact that it ignores all mitt, also a pretty good sign that you are you might be able to go quite a bit faster with this character, right? And even if you don't, just the fact that this ignores this plus the damage amp means that even through critical hit resistance, she might actually still kill. Now, Neo Phantom Sword was also changed. When attacking, if the target is a hero, ignores damage reduction and damage sharing effects. So, same thing. By the way, Neo Phantom Sword increases damage dealt proportional to target's max health. Dispelled after attacking. They increase the damage on Neo Phantom Sword, which is wild to me because Soul Burn on Neo Phantom Sword is basically like insta kill against a lot of tanks and a lot of bruisers. So upping that damage again is pretty ludicrous to me. It seems like with these changes, they want to make sure that her damage is so damn high that she kills even through the Navy Captain Landy uh, critical hit resistance. So uh, as a Karin enthusiast, I'm pretty stoked about this. The only real negative to these changes is that 
uh, our Bankai doesn't get rid of uh, the two debuff dispel anymore, right? So uh, character super susceptible to something like Para. Like in the past, you didn't really care about Para. Like if the sequencing was Para into Karin, um, not a big deal. This move not having a dispel that could be the kicker. But you know what? We're trying to have some counterplay. Like I'm always down for counterplay in characters. We'll see how it is. But overall. I'm pretty happy with this set of changes because Last Piece Corinne is pretty much my go-to anti-dodge unit uh, due to her just natural speed advantage, right? Like, I'm not a very, very fast player, so having that extra seven base speed or so, that really helps me. All right, let's round it out by talking about the two artifacts really, really quick. First up is Alexa's Basket, which in the current day and age has a lot of consistency issues that need addressing because it's only like a 20 to 40% chance to get the gab. If you don't get the gab, it feels really bad. The critical hit chance buff is basically irrelevant. Most people are going to be building 100% or very close to 100% chance um, on the character. Like I've seen some people play like 87 to 93 and are just banking on the extra critical hit chance from Alexis Basket. But since they changed Wind Rider like a ways back, there hasn't really been a reason to play Alexis Basket. Wind Rider has just basically been the default damage artifact on this thing. So what they gave it instead. Here is exactly what you were hoping for. They got rid of the critical hit chance buff on it and just gave it regular attack buff with a 35 to 70% chance based on artifact level and then a 20 to 40% chance to give you the greater attack buff still. So you still have the best case scenario, but your worst case scenario is a bit better. That said, I still don't think this is particularly good unless I'm just really bad at doing probability. This is what I believe like 82% chance that you'll get one of the two buffs, which that's essentially like the equivalent of a plus 18 or plus 21 Benny Maru's Tachi. And most people are saying like, I'm not going to play Benny Maru's Tachi until it's like 27 or 30. So yeah, it's definitely better, right? We address the consistency issues, but essentially only 80 to 85% of the time, you actually still get something out of the artifact. Whereas Wind Rider is 100% of the time you're getting a damage increase. So uh, for those of you that like the Gamba, this is probably still a great option, but I don't think this moves the needle that much for uh, many of the high-end players. Next up, we have Abyssal Crown, which, yet again, consistency issues, because this used to be one of the most degenerate artifacts in the game. It still kind of is, and it was one of the best artifacts in the entire game uh, back in the day, but Book has just kind of overshadowed it, and with how hyper-compressed games are now in Epic 7, if you're playing like Degen Poly, you need Abyssal to stun. Otherwise, the character has no impact and you've lost the game, right? So I can understand why here they increased the base chance on Abyssal Crown stun by 6%. It's the change it needed, but uh, man, people are really going to be upset <laughs> against some solitary players if they're still on Crown. So we'll see how this one pans out. It's definitely uh, a minor W for uh, the turn two players who are trying to combat things like Moonlight Politis, some cleave compositions, right? We'll take it. Overall, I love this patch. I think that there's a lot of great things in here. Blood Moon Haste is amazing. Robbie changes, again, exquisitely designed. Celine, awesome. Last Piece Corinne, love to see it. And even Abyssal Crown, I'm happy about, right? I, I would say if you're a turn two player, this was a good patch for you, right? Is it everything that I want? No, but it's a good patch for us. I feel like we get some actual tools to fight back uh, for once. But yeah, those are just my thoughts on this. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know down in the comments below. What's your favorite thing about this balance patch? Was there something that you were hoping for that wasn't in the balance patch? Would love to hear any and all comments. As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you in the next one. Later now.